Even though JS's army was highly skilled in ground warfare, their marine warfare capabilities were inferior to California. Of course, I'll lead the team myself, Henry assured. It was a chance for the president to participate in the battle himself, and he was not going to let the opportunity pass by. But with the role he played and the responsibility he held, he could only keep his distance from the actual battlefield and intercept Gabriel if needed. Harris opened the map of California's marine defense and began to plan a route to take Long Island. They began to make plans and work out countermeasures. With everything in place, all they had to do was wait for the engagement to happen. It was then that Henry finally understood why his son had decided to marry Amelia. It was all to save Christine. Harris, sorry for putting you through this, Henry said as he patted his son's shoulder. This is nothing, father, Harris smiled. I have to repay Megan the favor for saving me. You're the one who taught me that no favor should go unpaid. That's my son. Hurry up and make any preparations needed and wait for my order. Yes, sir. See you soon, Mr. President. Connor also took his leave. After they left, Elijah came to the White Tower to make reports on the bug that was planted in it. Who ordered Ken to plant the device? Henry asked. Please take a second look at this, Elijah said while he pointed at a screenshot on his computer screen. This is the source of the bug. This is... is it her? Henry stammered as he could not believe his eyes. He had never expected that the one who was spying on him was his own wife, Renee. Where is Ken? An interrogation. I want to interrogate him myself. Sir, Elijah quickly made arrangements and brought Henry to meet with Ken. Ken was tied to a chair in the interrogation room and he raised his head when he heard people coming in. Did he say anything? Henry asked the interrogator. No, his lips are sealed very tight. Is that so? Henry stopped in front of Ken and stared at the man who was covered in blood. Why did you betray me? Henry asked. It was hard for Henry to believe it because the family had been serving the Helian family for generations and had gained their trust. Mr. President, I'm sorry. Ken finally began to speak when he was confronted by the president. What else did that woman ask you to do? N nothing else. Still not talking, are we? You know I can make everyone in the family a traitor to the country, right? You better consider your options to keep the pride of your family or have them spend the rest of their lives in prison with you. You can try my patience. I'll only count to three. Henry turned to leave and said, One. Ken started sweating and was quickly soaking wet. Two. Mr. President was about to reach the door, but if he told him the truth, would Mrs. President give him another chance? Three. Before Henry finished the word, Ken rushed to say, Okay, okay, Mr. President, I'll tell you what I know. From Ken, Henry came to know a series of terrifying facts. Renee had been spying on him for many years. She knew whatever he was after. She had informants all over the presidential palace. Ken had heard a lot from Renee, too. For instance, she had planted the fire in the theater in California. She secretly banned the perfect scenery nationwide and made it vanish from the market. She had her assistant, Eugene, follow Finn and replace the result of the test, and so on and so forth. It always had been that woman. Henry recalled the series of happenings and realized that each time he had tried to visit New York, there was an emergency that kept him from leaving. Now it turned out to be her conspiracy rather than coincidence. It had always been her who tried whatever she could to stop him from finding the truth about Christine's death. That was the reason for all her evil deeds. Henry grew outraged upon hearing the truth. 
He had always been trying to be a good leader and provide his people with a better country, but his so-called wife had been committing all those horrible crimes. How many innocent people had died because of her selfishness? He rushed to the red chamber carrying his anger. It was the first time he stepped into the red chamber throughout the years. Inside the red chamber, Renee was waiting for the signal from Ken's bug, but she got nothing. Eugene, go find Ken and ask him what is going on. Why didn't we hear anything so far? Renee asked Eugene. Yes, madam. Eugene took her order, but before he could turn around, someone announced at the door. No need. The two in the room turned at the same time and found Henry standing at the door. They screamed as if they had seen a ghost. Renee rushed to cover the bugging devices and stood up. Henry, what brings you here? It was such a surprise. She had never expected Henry to come to the Red Chamber. She had sent for him with various kinds of excuses throughout the years, but he never came even once, so what was he doing here today? I want to know what you are doing. Henry entered the room step by step with a chilling coldness that could almost pierce their skin. Renee tried to pretend to be calm. She dispelled Eugene and smiled. What could I be doing? You never came whenever I've sent for you. What brought you here today? Henry pinched her chin unexpectedly and questioned her with the bug in his hand. Take a close look. What is this? I have no idea. Renee felt that her chin was about to be crushed. Is that so? It was you who asked Ken to put this in my study and spy on me. Now he has been caught and told me everything. So tell me, what else have you done apart from spying, bugging, and causing all those horrible incidents? Henry questioned her with resentment. Renee did not expect that Ken would get caught and even rat her out. Lillian, please listen to me. I did all of these things for you. Renee tried to argue. Bullshit, Henry scolded. You were supposed to assist me in making the country better, and yet you did so many wrong things behind my back instead. Speak, woman. What is your goal? I... I did not, Renee stammered. If you had only focused on me, I would have never had to do all those things to get your attention. Silence. Do you think I really have no idea that you were the run responsible for stopping me from meeting with Christine? You really are one sick person. Henry pushed Renee away and she fell to the ground, looking at the man high above her with teary eyes. There was no compassion nor mercy in Henry's eyes, only anger. You are not fit to be California's first lady anymore. You have forced me to file for a divorce. No, please, anything but a divorce. Renee was caught entirely off guard and grabbed onto Henry's legs, begging him not to leave her. You should have expected that a day like this would come when you decided to take the wrong path, Henry said coldly and turned away. You are the president of California, Renee shouted. Aren't you afraid that others will laugh at you? So what if I become a laughing stock? It's still better than being the husband of a vile woman. But you must have loved me. You even covered me with your coat in front of everyone once. Renee thought that what Henry had done was his way of showing his affection towards her. All I did was for Harris, not you, Henry said coldly as he kicked Renee off his legs. Tomorrow is Harris's engagement, so you better keep your act up. Henry left, leaving the woman on the ground shivering in fear. She could tell that Henry was serious about the divorce. What to do? What should I do? A huge engagement party was held at the city's best hotel the next day. It was the engagement of California's General Harris and the nation's goddess Amelia. The party attracted reporters who were local and foreign. A lot of high-ranking officials also attended the party, including the Secretary of State, Sheldon, and his wife and daughter. The president's cousin and his son, Mosby, were present at the party, too. 
Megan attended the party with Connor as Toby, but her complexion was paler than the actual Toby and was prettier than most women. At the banquet, she ran into Mosby, and he recognized her as the young man who had messed up with him in front of the cafe last time. Mosby stared at her rudely when he passed by. Connor waited until he was gone and asked, Why was that man staring at you? Who knows? Perhaps he's gay. Megan did not dare to tell her husband about her heroic deed that day, and Connor took it seriously that Mosby was gay, because he found that man staring very inappropriately at Megan who was disguised as a man. While they were talking, Rose saw Toby and came to greet him. Hey, Mr. Toby, I wasn't expecting you to be here. The young woman stared at him with her eyes glowing. She was definitely into him. Connor found this very inappropriate. Fine, now he wanted to hide his wife again. How could she be so charming, either as a woman or a man? She was too charming to be exposed to the public. The guests were almost here. President Henry and his wife Renee showed up, followed by the newly engaged couple. Harris was featurely handsome in his uniform, while Amelia looked gorgeous in her luxurious gown. They seemed like a perfect couple. They got engaged with the presence of many journalists. Harris was expressionless all the way through. No one could tell what he was thinking about. It was probably only Amelia herself that felt happy about the engagement. When he helped her put on the engagement ring, Amelia felt like she was the happiest woman in the world. Megan went to the restroom during the ceremony. In order to avoid trouble, she went to the men's room instead, but when she came out, she found a huge figure blocking her way. She tried to see his face clearly and was shocked at the sight of Mosby. Did he come for revenge? Mosby, what do you want? Megan was on alert. What do you think I want? You ruined my day earlier on. Now that I've got you here, what do you suggest I should do? Mosby lifted her chin and flirted. Mosby, someone like you should never bother yourself with someone like me. Could you let me go? Megan turned away from his fingers. I will consider your suggestion if you make me satisfied. Mosby was stunned when staring at him. This man was way too beautiful. How could a man be more beautiful than a woman? It was pure seduction. Plus, he smelled faintly good. It was too provocative. I have no idea what you mean, Mosby. Megan found him so disgusting, she felt like vomiting at the sight of the hypocritical Mosby. I heard it feels much better to have intercourse with the man. I've always wanted to try. Disgusting. Way too disgusting. It turned out that Mosby was a bisexual freak. Upon saying that, Mosby tried to push her back into the stall. Megan managed to push him away and ran as fast as she could. Unfortunately, she was stopped by Mosby's guards at the door. Where are you going? The arrogant Mosby told the guards. Catch him. I'll play hard with him today. The two bodyguards tried to grab Megan and she defended herself. Taking down the two bodyguards was not a problem for Megan, but what troubled her was Mosby himself. They exchanged punches for a few rounds, and Megan was pinned to the wall in the end. Megan and her face facing the wall, while Mosby locked her legs with his knees, and her hands with his. What can you do now, huh? Mosby whispered beside Megan's ear. Let me go, or you'll regret it, Megan warned as she struggled. You really are the first person who dares to talk like that to me, but let me tell you this. You've already got my attention. Now, I really want to try what another man tastes like. Megan was in dire situation and tried to scream for help, but Mosby had his other hand over her mouth. She knew that if Mosby found out that she was a woman, he would have never let her go. Just as Mosby was about to undo Megan's clothes, he could feel someone closing in behind him. Before he could even react, the person kicked him and sent him flying to the door. 
Mosby studied himself and realized that the person who kicked him was the movie king who came with Harris, Connor. Mosby began to suspect that both Connor and Toby were actually a gay couple. The moment Megan regained her freedom, she ran and hid behind her husband. Connor couldn't believe that his wife had almost been sexually assaulted, again, even when she was dressed up as a man. You dare pick a fight on my... Connor paused before continuing. Man? Megan turned her head and looked at Connor as what he said felt too weird. So what? You're going to die anyway, Mosby scolded and tried to punch him, thinking that Connor only knew a few martial arts moves from his acting career. But beyond his expectation, Connor caught his punch and threw him back to the floor. Mosby climbed back up and smiled. Not bad. Looks like you've trained before. Come on. Mosby launched another attack, but Connor did not hold back and threw him back to the ground before raining down on his face with punches. Stop, stop, Mosby begged as he cowered in pain. Mosby, Connor shouted, you better not lay another finger on him again. If you do, I'll make sure that you never see the daylight again. Mosby nodded quietly, not even daring to utter another word. With everything taken care of, Connor grabbed Megan's hand, and they left the bathroom together. Oh my god, you were really cool back there, Megan praised. You are not allowed to look that good when you go out in the future, Connor turned and scolded. Fine, fine, I'll pretend to be an old grandma next time. What if you attract some weird old man, Connor said, recalling how pretty Megan was when she dressed up as an old woman in the past. Megan seriously doubted he would ever allow her to go out again. The news of Harris and Amelia's engagement was spread throughout the world. Everyone knew that the son of the president of California got engaged with Amelia. Caroline saw it in the newspaper in New York, too. Seeing the picture of Harris and Amelia in the engagement ceremony, she felt overwhelmingly heartbroken. They told her that last time Harris faked his relationship with Amelia in order to save Megan, but what was this about now? Megan was saved, but they still got engaged. What could that mean? It could only mean that he was serious. Harris had fallen in love with Amelia. Alas, she knew she should not have had expectations, but she could not control her own heart. Now that they were officially engaged, her secret wish finally came to nothing. Heartbroken, indescribable pain was devouring her. If it was not for the child she was carrying, she barely had any other reason to live. Harris, it was my biggest mistake to fall in love with you. After Harris's engagement ceremony, they immediately started planning for a second visit to Long Island. It was set to be the following morning. Connor and Harris disguised themselves as Amelia's bodyguards, as they had done last time. They prepared another mask for Christine, too. Megan accompanied them to the wharf. She hoped that they could come back safe and sound, no matter if they could save her mother this time or not. The ship set sail towards the Black Sea and successfully entered Long Island. They came to Palace and met Trevor and Madeline. Trevor and Madeline were sitting in the garden under the sun. Trevor was half squatting by her side and placing his ear on her belly. Madeline enjoyed their life sincerely. She was filled with happiness to have Trevor being exceptionally nice to her and the child. Trevor must have had a profound love for Megan. That was why he treated her so meticulously ever since she got pregnant. Perhaps if he was not what he was brought up to be, he could really have made a very good husband. He is still tiny and can't hear anything. He surely can. They say a father and his child are connected. I can definitely feel him. Trevor raised his head and smiled at her. Madeline found that her heart stopped for a second. She was stunned that a devil could have the smile of an angel. 
he must be very happy to be able to put on such a hearty smile. If only she was not a clone, and he was not the king of Long Island, they could make such a perfect couple. However, the truth was biting. The loss she was going to take was much more than the happiness she received. Whenever thinking of this, Madeline could not help but weep. What's up? Why are you crying again? Trevor got up and sat down by her. He cuddled her and wiped her tears. He thought that perhaps pregnant women were always sensitive. The tiniest matter might trigger the sensitive nerves. Stop crying. We will live happily together forever. Trevor wiped her tears, raised her chin, and placed a firm kiss upon her lips. <clears throat> Someone interrupted them abruptly. Trevor let go of his wife and turned to look at the source of the cough. It was from his little sister who had just gotten home. Why did you not report when you got back? Trevor scolded. Why do I even have to report when coming back to my own home? Amelia asked with her assistant and two other bodyguards standing beside her as she walked forward. Looks like your relationship with my sister-in-law is getting better, Amelia joked. I'm getting jealous. Aren't you the same, getting what you want? Trevor was referring to Amelia's wedding with Harris. He had already gotten wind of the proposal. Yes, and that's why I'm here, to tell you the good news. I'll be married to the general soon, and I hope you can give us your blessings. I won't go against your wishes, Trevor said and paused. But I do have a condition. You are to get me California's military development map once you have the chance. Trevor planned on using his own sister to get the most guarded secrets of California. Amelia turned to look at Harris, disguised as a guard awkwardly. She never thought that her brother would say something like that. She was worried that Harris might be angered by it. Are you asking me to be a spy? Amelia asked, not willing to do what her brother had requested. Amelia really wanted to have a good life with Harris, and stealing was not a part of her plan. Of course. Do you really think that I allowed you to marry into the Helian family just for happiness? Why can't I? You got your happiness. I want mine too. If you're asking me to betray Harris, then I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do it. You pass. Trevor smiled. I'm just testing you. It's true that they say girls have outgoing personalities. Amelia sighed, almost believing her brother's request was real. Just as Amelia was thinking of a way to get to the island, Bryce's servant arrived before them, requesting the queen to meet with the former emperor. Trevor wanted to refuse, but Madeline was already feeling better and said, I want to meet mum. Madeline had been accompanying Christine as Megan for the past few days, and that gave her a chance to feel what was it like to be loved by a parent. Since Megan gave her happiness, Madeline felt that the most she could do to repay the favor was to take care of Christine. All right, I'll send someone to go with you, Trevor said, unable to accompany his wife because he has a matter to attend to. Brother, why don't I accompany her? Amelia took the chance and asked. I kind of missed our father, too. Fine, Trevor agreed, but you better take good care of her. If anything happens to Megan, I'll feed you to the sharks. I get it. And so Amelia left Trevor's room with her companions and Madeline. They boarded the ship that was heading towards the island and entered the castle. Connor noticed that the landscape of the castle was ultimately the same as Megan's had described. He knew that it wouldn't be long before he got to meet his mother-in-law. Madeline said that she had already woken up a while ago. It was in great favor of their rescue plan. It would be much easier to take a sober person away than carrying a sleeping beauty. They entered the castle and saw Christine in a parlor. Gabriel was sitting next to her by the window. She was looking at the azure sky outside, and her sight followed the flying seagulls. It was obvious that she longed for freedom. 
Mother, Madeline went to her and called out. Hearing her daughter calling, Christine turned and smiled. Connor was truly shocked by the sight of Christine. She looked so much younger than she should have been. She seemed gentle and elegant. Just like Megan, her every move and smile was breathtaking. No wonder back then Harry was besotted with her and Gabriel had given up all his fame and power for her. Harris was also surprised. Megan's mother looked pretty, the same as he'd seen in the pictures. She looked young and somewhat familiar. Seeing the others following her daughter, Christine wondered, Who are they? Gabriel turned to them with his cold and malicious look. He did not seem to be happy to see his own daughter. A father... Amelia trotted to him and squatted by his side. She was, after all, his daughter. Instead of trying to get rid of her, Gabriel asked, What brought you here? Amelia missed you, father. I came for you. Gabriel did not reply. Christine knew that this girl must be Gabriel's daughter. Bryce, I'd like some privacy with my daughter if you don't mind. Christine hoped that Gabriel could leave her alone for a while. Amelia seized the opportunity and asked, Yeah, father, Megan must have a lot to say to her mother. I have something to tell you, too. Let's go. Fine. Gabriel took a glance at Christine and left the room with Amelia reluctantly. They were left alone in the room. Connor already had told Madeline about their plan on the way over, and Madeline did not want help. Then she got hold of Christine's hand and said, Mother, they came all the way to save you. Go with them now. What? Christine looked at the two men and a woman she had never met before and wondered what they were here for. To save time, Connor added. Ancy, please come with us. We all came here to get you out. Connor could not explain his relationship with Megan right now. Therefore, he had to call her auntie. Came for me? How can I trust you? After being trapped in the castle for over a decade, Christine found it hard to believe that these strangers came all of a sudden purely to save her. What if they were sent by Gabriel? If she followed them, she would be walking into his trap. We mean no harm. Please trust us. This is your family in New York, Xavier, Richard, and Megan. They're all waiting for you. Connor mentioned the people she knew in order to win her trust. My father, my brother, and my daughter? Christine looked at the girl right next to her and laughed. Do you think I'm stupid? My daughter is right here next to me. What are you planning? No, she's not your real daughter. Connor explained as he took out the brooch that was left for Christine. Your daughter is in California right now. If you don't believe me, then take a look at this. Christine looked at the brooch and tears began to fill her eyes. It was the memoir that she had left her years ago. She felt like someone was tightening her heart as breathing became harder. I did leave this to my daughter. Oh, what is happening here? What confused Christine the most was that her daughter was indeed standing right beside her. I'm sorry, but I'm not Megan, Madeline said slowly. I'm sorry for lying to you, but I'm just a clone of Megan. Christine was shocked by the truth, and words could not escape her mouth. Please, we can't stay here any longer, Connor begged. If Gabriel finds out we're here, then we'll lose our only chance to escape. Okay, I'll leave with you all. What should I do? Connor explained their plan to Christine. With Christine up to speed, she changed her clothes with Mona, Amelia's assistant, so that they could switch roles. After the preparations were done, Christine stood where Mona had been standing while Mona lay down next to Madeline. Not long after that, Amelia came back with her father. After exchanging looks with Connor, Amelia knew that they were ready to leave. I should go back then, father, Amelia said. I'll come back and see you again next time. Okay, Gabriel nodded, not being bothered whenever his daughter actually would come back to visit him in the future or not. Amelia quickly guided Connor, Harris, and Christine out of the castle and left the island. It wasn't until they were far away from the island they could finally let out sighs of relief. 
Luckily, we weren't found out, Harris sighed. No, we can't let our guards down yet, Amelia warned. I'm not sure how long Mona can trick my father. If he finds out we took her away, he'll go crazy for sure. Gabriel did not suspect anything was off at first, as he sat down beside his woman. Mona thought that if she kept quiet, Gabriel would not realize that she was not Christine, but there was one flaw in her plan. Gabriel would talk to Christine from time to time. Are you hungry? Do you want to eat something? Gabriel asked. Mona shook her head, not even letting any of her voice escape. The wind's wild. Here, put this on. Gabriel put a jacket over who he thought was Christine, but when his finger accidentally touched the woman in front of him, she jumped up in fear. What's wrong? Gabriel asked curiously. Mona shook her head and acted as if she had a headache. Are you feeling unwell? Come, let's get you back to your room. Gabriel took the woman by her shoulder and guided her back to the bedroom. When they entered the bedroom, Gabriel released her and stared at her suspiciously. What's going on? Are you okay? Gabriel had extremely fair skin, which made him look like a vampire. Mona was too scared to even look at him. When he got closer, Mona stepped back subconsciously and shivered violently. Gabriel noticed the difference. Christine would never act like that. Christine had always been cold but never scared. That woman, she was never afraid of him, so who was the scared girl in front of him? Gabriel suddenly got a hold of her wrist and stared at her for a while. Then he was shocked and asked, Who are you? Mona did not dare to answer. Gabriel took her by the throat and rubbed on the edge of her cheek. Soon enough, the skin was peeled. Gabriel picked the edge and tore off a mask. The revealed face seemed familiar. Wasn't she his daughter's assistant? Could it be his daughter who had planned this to replace Christine with Mona? Why did she do this to him? Gabriel found it out and was enraged. He yelled at her, tell me, what's going on? Where is Christine? If you refuse to tell, I will strangle you. Mona was lifted from the ground, taken by the throat. She could barely breathe and was almost choking. She kept beating on Gabriel's arm and begged, I, I'll tell you. Gabriel threw her away and Mona told him everything about their rescue. Knowing that Christine had already been smuggled out, Gabriel kicked Mona away and darted out of the castle. He ordered the warship to charge at full speed. The cruiser had passed the patrol and was about to cross the magnet shield. Right then, several dark warships came after them. People were calling through speakers, Stop the ship! Don't let them go! The patrol ships turned immediately to stop them upon hearing the order. Shit, my father is after us. Amelia saw the warships from Ghost Island. She thought they would definitely be dead if they got caught today. Connor saw the steersmen sweating, so he took over the steering controls and led the ship to proceed at full speed. When they crossed the magnet shield, a bomb fell about two meters behind them. It splashed and soaked their ship in clothes. Continuous bombing was heard behind them. They could only head forward as fast as they could without any hesitation. Eventually, they got out of the Black Sea, but the ghost warship followed them beyond the magnet shield. The ghost warship followed them all the way from the Black Sea to the seas of California. And when it was about to catch them, a huge number of California warships came from all around. They fired at the ghost warship and saved Connor's ship from the hunt. Thundering fires were heard behind them. Harris turned to look at the battlefield and felt relieved. Luckily, my father helped. Otherwise, we would already be smashed. Probably not smashed, but we would have gotten caught and torn up later on. Connor knew what Gabriel's bombs would never really hit them. He was merely trying to stop them and get Christine back. Now that they were out of danger, they began to change out of their wet clothes. Christine tore off the fake face that she had on and put on a light beige dress with tree leaves as designs that she got from Amelia. Even though their design of the dress was clean and pure, which was suitable for younger girls, 
It looked good on Christine. It was as if she had not aged ever since she fell asleep. She even looked better than Amelia in the dress. After Christine finished changing, she stepped out onto the deck and was met with a smile from Harris. Christine was instantly stunned by him as the man before her looked a lot like Gregory. It was as if the man before her was made from the same mold as Gregory, the only difference being that the man was way younger. Christine turned to look at the other man, who was seriously attractive, and wondered what connections he had with the Lee family to make him risk his life saving her. Thank you, both of you, Christine said. Connor smiled, thinking that there was no need for Christine to thank him, and looked at the harbor that was not far away from them. Look over there, Connor said while pointing at the harbor. Megan is there waiting for us. Everyone turned to look towards the harbor, and they could see a lot of people standing there. Connor was eager to let his wife meet her long-lost mother. Megan was waiting impatiently at the harbor with Woody and Layla. She kept praying to God that Connor and all of them could save her mother without any harm. With Megan was also Henry. She and her personal guard standing behind him. He personally directed all Marines to protect and provide safe passage for Connor's boat that day. As soon as he got the signal, he ordered his troops to fire at Long Island's Phantom Squad. Among the explosions and guns fired, he could see a white yacht heading towards them. At that moment, Henry could not even express his own feelings. He really wanted to meet his little moon, but another side of him was worried that she was not on the yacht. It was very complicated. The yacht finally stopped at the harbor, and the people waiting there could see who were on board. Connor and Harris stood by the edge and waved towards their waiting friends and families. With the expressions that both of the men had, Megan was sure that their plan was a success. The yacht finally stopped, and both of the men aboard guided the ladies down. The first to step out was Amelia, followed by a woman in a light beige dress. Her hair moved slightly with the wind, covering half of her smile. Her skin was pale under the sunlight, as if she was a pearl that shone brightly. The woman scanned the faces at the harbor and finally spotted one that she was familiar with. It was the face of a man that she would never forget. It was Gregory. He was standing at the harbor and was staring at her with his face slightly lifted up. Gregory, am I dreaming? Christine asked herself. Seeing him again, Christine could not help bursting into tears. No one knew what she had gone through these years. Time stopped at that moment. The man on the shore felt the same way. He stared at her silently with tears in his eyes. She was finally back, alive! She looked no less charming and breathtaking, but she seemed so weak, as if a tiny butterfly that could be blown away by a stronger breeze. Seeing her back alive, Henry was mad with joy and excitement. How he wished that he could run to her and embrace her, but right now, there was a whole world between them. He could do nothing but watch her silently. Eventually, Christine was the one who managed to turn away. She collected her sorrow and got off the ship step by step, supported by Connor. She was slim and weak and far from fully recovered. It was hard enough for her to walk. It took her a long while to walk across the 10-meter board, and she almost fell off when she stepped onto the ground. Luckily, Connor was by her side and kept her from falling. Seeing her almost fall, Henry's heart skipped a beat. He stood there and saw her pass by in front of him. He reached out his hand, but could only pull it back in vain. They were indeed the most intimate strangers to each other now. Seeing her mother coming back safe and sound, Megan ran to her and hugged her hard. Mother. She could no longer hold her tears. She just wanted to stay with her mother and never be parted again. Christine was surprised to see a man running to her and calling her mother. It made her feel helpless. She turned to Connor for an explanation. This is Megan. She's just disguised as a man. He patted his wife on the back and tried to calm her down. Megan, let's take Auntie home now. Megan released her mother, wiped the tears, and held her arm. Mother, let's go home. 
Recognizing her daughter's voice, Christine felt relieved. When she left the wharf with them, she turned to take a glance at the man standing by the shore. He seemed sad and lonely. Christine turned away, as she knew it was their fate. She had known for many years that he was already married to another woman. She shed a tear when turning away and said silently to him, Take care. Connor asked Megan to take Christine back to the villa. The battle was not over. He and Harris had to stay here with the president. Inside the villa, Megan washed off her makeup, got dressed, and changed back to herself. When coming to her mother again, they stared at each other in tears for a long while. Then Christine opened her arms and said, Megan, come to mother. Mother. Megan did not want to control herself any further. She jumped into her arms and they cried on each other's shoulders. Christine lifted her daughter's face, wiped her tears and said, I never expected that I could see you again. I never thought that you would be alive either, Megan sobbed. But the clone that looks like you in the castle, who is she? Christine asked. Megan began to explain to her mother how they had discovered her being held captive by Gabriel on the Phantom Island, and how she was being forced to marry Trevor but was saved by Connor and Madeline. Ever since Megan found out that her mother was alive in the castle, she knew that she had to find a way to save her, and with her friends and family's help, she was able to do so. And so you're saying that California's president and his son helped out too? The young man with Connor is Henry's son? Yes, Megan answered. His name is Harris, and he's California's general right now. Oh, Christine sighed, feeling a little regretful, as Gregory already had a son of that age. How about Connor? Who is he? Mom, Megan laughed. He's your son-in-law. Wait, so you're married to Connor and not him? Yep, he tried to separate us, but he has no idea that the woman lying next to him is Madeline and not me. But I'm worried that her identity will be exposed. Christine was worried that by saving her, they would put Madeline in danger and would come to catch Megan again. Let's talk about this some other time. You need a rest now. We still have time to catch up. No, I already have had enough rest. Stay and talk with me. I want to know what happened in the past decade. After being asleep for more than a decade, Christine knew that she had to catch up on the recent development. Megan nodded and began to tell her mother stories of the recent past. The fight on the ocean finally ceased. The Phantom Troop was defeated, and the remaining members retreated back to Long Island. When Gabriel learned that his troops had not retrieved Christine, he was furious. You guys are useless, Gabriel scolded, and headed to his boat, speeding towards the middle island looking for Trevor and Megan. Gabriel believed that Megan was responsible for sneaking Christine off of the island. Trevor was having lunch with his wife when they heard the guards shouting outside, Lord Bryce, you cannot enter. Get out of my way if you cherish your life, Gabriel scolded, kicking the guards to the side and pushing the door open. Father, why are you here? Trevor asked in surprise. Gabriel did not reply and flipped the table, throwing all the foods and drinks to the floor. You, Gabriel stared at Madeline. You are the one who took Christine away from me. I don't know what you're talking about, Madeline said as she hid behind Trevor. Father, what happened? What angered you? Trevor stopped his father in his path. Ask her yourself. There's no way Christine could have gotten away from me if she did not bring people onto our land. Gabriel wished to kill Megan. If only he had known that if she had such plans, he would have never let her come to Christine. Trevor figured out what had happened and tried to explain. Megan did not take them there. It was Amelia. You should blame Amelia for it. Whatever. You are all in this. You get my Christine back. Father, calm down. How am I supposed to calm down? My Christine is gone. Gabriel was so mad that he passed out after vomiting blood. Father? Trevor had Gabriel carried to his room and asked for the doctor to take care of him. And then he turned to Megan. Was that you? Madeline did not explain much. Trevor could barely do anything to her. He understood how badly she wanted to save her mother. 
fine. Even if it was you, I will take the blame from my father. No worries. Thank you, Trevor. Madeline knew that as long as Trevor was on her side, Gabriel could do nothing to her. When the war was over, Connor left the wharf with Harris and his father. He thanked them again and proposed to hold an appreciation party for them at the villa later. It would be improper for Henry to attend, but he agreed to his proposal somehow for the sake of Christine. Henry returned to the presidential palace very depressed. The butler reported, Mr. President, a lawyer have been waiting. Right. Henry stepped into the white chamber and met Clay in the parlor. Clay stood up and waved for him to sit down. Mr. President, as you mentioned, I have proposed a divorce to your wife, but she did not agree. Clay had talked to Renee in private about the divorce, but she was completely against it, so there was not much he could do at this point. There has to be a divorce. Henry was resolute. Ever since he saw Christine coming back alive, he knew that there could no longer stand this woman. It is better to have a peaceful divorce by consent. Try to talk to her again and see what she wants. I see. After their conversation, Clay left the white chamber for Renee again. An hour later, Renee's voice was heard from outside. Henry, I want to see Henry. Let me in. The guards disagreed. No one can enter the white chamber without the president's permission. I miss this president. How can you do this to me? The guard remained untouched. Renee was outraged. How could the guard stop her in her own house? Henry, Henry, she kept calling and eventually Henry showed up. The man seemed as cold as ice as if she was a stranger. Henry, finally you showed up. What do you want? Since Ken was caught, Henry found out about what Renee had done. She thought he was merely warning her by proposing a divorce until his lawyer, Clay, came to her. There was no way. She would rather die than get divorced. Now she came to the White Chamber to talk to him in person, hoping that he could withdraw the proposal. Henry, can we talk in private? I have something to say. As it was always said, domestic matters should not be made public. It would be humiliating to talk about it in the presence of all these guards and servants. Henry gave Renee a chance to explain herself, but not in the White Tower, in a small pavilion. Speak. What do you want? Henry asked with his back towards Renee. I know that you don't like me and want a divorce, but I really hope you will reconsider, Renee said. Our kid is an adult now, and he's about to have his own family. If we have a divorce now, it will have a bad impact on him. You're right, he's an adult now, which means that he can live on his own and our divorce has nothing to do with him. The divorce must happen and I will fulfill any conditions you want. Henry was already at the stage where he would abandon everything, even his position as the president to live with Christine. What if I say I want the moon castle and the rose garden? Renee asked. Impossible. The moon castle and rose garden were both built for Christine, and Henry had already given them to their daughter, Megan. There was no way he could agree to that. See, you can't fulfill all of my conditions, Renee scolded. I've been staying by your side for years, and never even you cared for me. You would only act like a good husband in public. Why can't you keep on acting? Why do you want a divorce? Henry knew why, but he couldn't tell Renee that the reason was Christine. Because you have failed as the first lady and you must step down from your position, Henry explained. Failed? Then how about you? You never did your part as my husband ever since we were married 20 years ago. You're right, and that's why I want a divorce, because I'm not fit to be your husband. I'm giving you your freedom. What more do you want? But we have our own child, Renee shouted, using Harris as her last chess piece. You should know better than anyone how we have our son. You climbed onto my bed yourself when I was drunk. I, I did that because I love you. Please, at least do it for our son. I don't want a divorce, Renee kept on begging. You know I would have never married you if you were not pregnant with Harris, and I've been tolerating you because of him too. Now that he's a grown man, I have no such obligations anymore.
The thing that Henry regretted the most was allowing Rene to get close to him when he lost Christine. Henry had vowed that he would not touch another woman other than Christine, but he broke it, and he was ashamed of it. But what Henry did not know was that he had never had any intercourse with Rene. It was all fake. Through all these years, Rene had been keeping the secret. She would never tell anyone and keep it secret forever. Helian, don't divorce me. I'm not getting divorced. Renee burst into tears. She no longer cared about being elegant. She fell on the floor and pulled on Henry's pants. Henry took two steps backward, looked down on her, and asked, Do you find this marriage enjoyable after all these years, even without love? Yes, I enjoy it. I'm not getting divorced anyway, Renee insisted. Gosh, Henry sighed and questioned. I never interfered with your business all these years. But what have you done? Do you want to take a look? Renee shook her head violently while tears fell like rain. If Henry had found out about her affair, she was doomed. Instead of sending Finn, Henry had a secret guard investigate Renee. The results were outrageous. Henry brought out a stack of photos and threw them onto Renee. He sneered, see for yourself what you have done. It was proof of her unfaithfulness throughout the years. There were photos of her with several boys from the nightclub, the young film star she kept as a toy boy, and her affair with his cousin. What was done by night appeared by day. They agreed to stay out of each other's business, but he would never have imagined that she could play so dirty. It was humiliating. Rene was speechless in front of the evidence. She knew with these pieces of evidence they could be pronounced divorced. Henry definitely would not present these to the court. He had to protect the fame of the Helian family. Take these photos and go find your lovers. You're free now, woman. Henry mocked her and left the pavilion. Renee sat on the floor with her tears falling like rain. Everything was telling her that she had failed after all these years. When Henry left, her assistant Eugene came to get her up and reported something. Renee was surprised upon hearing the news. No wonder, no wonder he wants to divorce me at this point. The bitch is back. How could that happen? When did Christine wake up? Why did Gabriel fail to keep her in Long Island? Hearing such important news, Renee decided that she had to pay a visit to Long Island soon. Inside the villa, Megan ran towards Connor once he got home. She jumped into his arms and cuddled him around the neck. She kissed him on both cheeks, held his face with a smile, and said, Honey, you are my hero. Thanks for saving my mother. Thank you. Connor poked his nose on hers and said, Silly girl, you don't need to thank me for anything. You broke the rule again. How should I punish you? As you wish. Good. You said that yourself. Don't complain to your mother later on. Hey. After a satisfying kiss, Connor took her into the room. Hearing the noises, Christine came out of her room to see Connor taking her daughter into their bedroom. She smiled in relief to see her daughter and son-in-law deeply in love. Christine was relieved that her daughter had a great relationship with her husband. It was almost nighttime when Megan and Connor exited their bedroom. They could smell food as soon as they came out and looked at each other, wondering who was making the food. They ran down the stairs and found Christine cooking dinner in the kitchen with an apron over her. Mom, what are you doing? I'm supposed to do that, Megan said and tried to snatch the spatula away from her mother. No, I'll do it, Christine said, not handing the spatula and walk over to her daughter. You must miss my food, right? Mom. Tears began to roll down Megan's cheek. It had been years since she last tasted her mother's food, and she had thought that she would never taste them again. Come on, what are you crying for? Go wait outside. I'll be done in a jiffy. Okay, Megan laughed. I'll go get the kid with Connor. Kid? Christine asked, not knowing that Megan had a daughter already. Oh, right, I forgot to tell you. We already have a daughter now, and two more are still coming. You're a grandmother now. Megan had already reached the fourth month of her pregnancy, and there was a slight bulge in her belly which could not be seen if she had clothes on. 
Oh my, are you serious? I never thought that I would have the chance to meet my own grandchild. Christine jumped in happiness. What are you standing there for? Hurry up, I want to meet her. Okay, Megan smiled and left with Connor. Thirty minutes passed and they came back with Alice. The little girl had already heard from her mother that her grandmother was back to visit her. She ran into the house excitedly, without even changing her shoes and putting down her bag. Grandma, where are you? Alice shouted. Christine heard someone calling her and came out from the bedroom. She stood by the stairs and could see a cute little girl looking for her in the living room. I'm over here, Christine said, her heart softening as she walked down the stairs. Alice stared at Christine and recognized her from her gravestone. Grandma, did you come from heaven? Alice asked. Mommy said that you live there. Yes, little one, I'm from heaven. Come here and let me take a good look at you. Christine smiled and extended her arms. Alice ran into Christine's arms and touched her face. Grandma, you look very young. You're like mommy's sister. Christine laughed at Alice's compliment and asked, Tell me, what is your name? Did you forget? I told Grandma once before. I'm sorry, I can't remember it. The little girl thought that Christine had forgotten her name because she had told Christine once in front of her grave. Tell Grandma your name again, Megan said with a smile. Alice nodded and said, Grandma, my name is Elizabeth Wilson, Wilson as in my father's surname. My nickname is Alice. I see, I see. My baby has such cute names. Christine rubbed her on her little head. She had already fallen in love with this cute little girl. Everyone was home. Christine called them for dinner. They sat down at the table. Alice found that the dishes tasted different today. Gee, it's different today, not like daddy or mommy style. Oh, I know, grandma made it. Yeah, you're such a cutie. Have more. Christine kept refilling her plate and Alice had a lot. She also helped her daughter refill. Megan could not stop praising her. This is it. My mother makes the best dishes. Christine disagreed. I haven't been in the kitchen for over a decade and almost forgot how to cook. It was just a trial. Simply a trial could be good. Mother, if you cook every day, you will soon be a queen of cooking. Megan felt so happy and hoped that she could enjoy her mother's cooking every day. Help yourself, Connor. Christine helped her son-in-law refill, too. She found her son-in-law increasingly pleasing lately. What a perfect couple. Thank you, Auntie. Megan stepped on his foot when Connor said so. He turned to her and asked, What? Why did you step on me? What did you just call my mother? Megan raised her chin and asked. Connor realized and felt embarrassed. He turned to Christine and unofficially corrected himself. Sorry, I was wrong. Mother, you should have some more, too. Christine did not care about the way he addressed her. Never mind, let's enjoy our dinner. Having finished their dinner, Connor went playing with Alice while Megan spent more time with her mother. After a shower, Megan helped her mother dry her hair and told her about the plan. Mother, I'd like you to take some traditional herbal therapy, and I'll be in charge of your daily diet. I'll need your full cooperation. Christine had been kept in the underground crystal palace for too long. Her physical functions were decaying, and she was weak and lacked energy. Her skin was cold to the touch. She would need traditional medicine and herbal cuisine to get rid of the coldness plus some exercise to improve her physical functions. Sure, I'm all yours. Christine knew that her daughter was filial. They had risked their lives to save hers. There was no reason for her to waste it. Recalling what had happened in the past, Megan tried to ask, Megan, did you know? Your autobiography, The Perfect Scenery, was made into a movie. Mr. Daniel was the director and I starred in it. Seriously? Christine found it surprising. How could she have expected her own daughter to star in the script she had left many years ago? And I won the Best Actress Award for that role. I fulfilled your dream, mother. Well done, my daughter. You made me proud. Christine held her daughter's hands and put on a hearty smile. Megan held her mother's hands for a while and asked further, Mother, that Gregory and your script, the man you love dearly, was he my father? Christine's expression darkened and she sighed when she heard her daughter mentioning Gregory. 
Who is he? Where is he now? Megan asked, waiting eagerly for her mother to give her the answer. Yet Christine remained silent. Mom, please tell me, Megan begged. We can find him if he's still alive. I can even help you if you want to be back with him. Stop it, Christine muttered, not wanting to talk about it. After a few minutes of silence, Christine raised her head, showing her tear-covered face. Megan, it's not that I don't want to tell you, but it's already too late, Christine said. Gregory has his own family now, and I don't want to disturb him. I'm sure you can understand that. Mom, I'm sorry. Megan also began to cry as she hugged her mother. She understood what her mother meant and knew that it would be rude to disturb her father's peace. Her mother would also be labeled as the third party in her father's marriage and might bring troubles onto their own doorstep. Instead of living with that kind of pressure, they would rather live the remainder of their lives peacefully. Megan did not mind if she could never find her father because she was already living a happy life even without him. What was essential for her was to cherish life with her mother. Megan did not ask her mother about her father any further. Xavier got word that his sister was still alive the next day and went straight to the manor. He took off his military uniform and changed into casual clothing. The moment he stepped into the manor's living room, his eyes were focused on the woman sitting on the couch. He could tell from the woman's back that she was skinny. So thin that it felt like she had no meat under her skin. The woman was completely different from how he remembered her. Little sis... Xavier called out. Surprised by someone calling her, Christine turned to see a silhouette of a tall and well-built man standing by the door. She stood up slowly, her eyes never leaving the man. When the man walked closer to her, she could finally make out who the visitor was. He was her brother Xavier. Brother. Little sis. Christine ran into Xavier's arms and cried. Tears also began to fall down Xavier's cheeks. Xavier almost could not believe that his sister was still alive after she had been pronounced dead for more than a decade. He blamed himself for not being able to protect her, for not being able to notice that she was being mistreated by Michael. You, you, I'm so sorry. I couldn't protect you. Brother, it's not your fault. I don't blame you. Christine shook her head, not blaming her brother because she was scared of telling her family her conditions in the past. She did that so that she could protect them. But everything was in the past, and what was important to her was the present. As long as they were still alive, there would be hope. The siblings sat down. Xavier had learned about everything from Megan and asked Christine about her future plans. I want to go back to New York to see our father. I miss him so much. Recalling her own father, Christine shed tears again. Xavier handed her some tissues and said, Father missed you too. He will be more than happy to know you're still alive. When you are ready, I'll take you home to him. Right. Christine's death had been such a shock to her father years ago. Back then, Christine was determined to marry Michael, but Richard was against it. They were so angry at each other that they almost cut off their relationship, but after all, Richard was angry because he loved his daughter so much. It was catastrophic for him when he heard about Christine's suicide. He never recovered from the loss of his daughter throughout these years. Whenever he thought of her, it made him heartbroken, and he blamed himself for the tragedy. If he knew that she was still alive, he would be extremely pleased. Seeing her brother as handsome as he used to be, Christine could not help asking, Brother, did you get married? She remembered that her brother and miss were deeply in love. If they were married, their children should be grown-ups by now. Not yet. Xavier shook his head awkwardly. Why? Didn't you marry her? Xavier knew that she was referring to Jesse. He shook his head again. At the beginning, father was against it. Then she married someone else. She just got divorced recently, and I'm trying my best now. Do whatever you can, brother. Yes, I will. As for whether he could win back Jesse, Xavier really had no confidence in himself. Three days later, a very important guest visited the villa. President Henry and his son Harris paid a private visit to them. 
Several limousines drove into the garden and pulled over by the fountain. The retinues got out of the cars and opened the doors. Alice was playing some games in the front yard. She saw the cars and stood up. Recognizing her third daddy, Harris, she got excited and ran to them. Third daddy, what brought you here? I came to see you, my sweetheart. Harris bent down to pick up Alice and pressed his forehead against hers. Following him, Henry got out of the car. Seeing Henry holding a child, he asked, Is this Connor and Megan's daughter? Yeah, father. Isn't she a cutie pie? Indeed. Henry stared at the chubby little face and felt his heart soften at the sight of her. How adorable. She was his granddaughter. Can I hold her? Harris put away his manners and asked abruptly, Let me ask her. Harris turned to ask for the little girl's permission. Sweetie, this grandpa wants to hold you, if you don't mind. Why? Who is he? Alice learned over Harris's shoulder with her eyes wide open, staring curiously at Henry. He is your third daddy's daddy, so you can call him Grandpa. Grandpa thinks you are adorable and wants to hold you. Does Grandpa have no kid to hug at home? Alice wondered why everyone wanted her hugs whenever they saw her. No, there's no kid at Grandpa's home. I'm telling you this. Grandpa has never held any kids so far, Harris told Alice secretly. Alice was a compassionate girl. Upon hearing this, she felt sad for the Grandpa and said, Poor Grandpa. Okay then, I'll let him hold me for a while. What a good kid. Harris smiled as he put Alice in his father's arms. Henry could feel a sense of familiarity from Alice as he hugged her. And it was probably due to them being related by blood. When Connor and Megan heard a car stopping in front of their manor, they went out to greet their guest. Mr. President, General, welcome to our humble home, the couple greeted, but were instantly shocked when they saw Alice lying in Henry's arms. Megan hurried to them and tried to get Alice away, saying, Come here. Yet Alice took a liking to the new uncle and did not want to go away from him. It's okay, Henry said. I can take care of her. He did not put Alice down and walked straight into the manor. They sat down in the living room while Connor prepared tea for them. Megan went back into the kitchen to help her mother with the food. Christine only knew that they would be hosting a few crucial guests that night, but did not know who they were. Are the guests here? Christine asked when she saw her daughter entering the kitchen. Yep, Connor is accompanying them. All right, the food is almost done. Oh my, they smell really good. Even though Christine has not stepped into the kitchen for years, she has never forgotten how to cook. As soon as she was in the kitchen, she knew she could still do it. Not only could she make tasty foods, but she could also present them very well, turning them into works of art. It was from Christine that Megan had learned how to cook. Henry and his son sat in the living room until the food was prepared, and they were invited into the dining room. Connor guided his guests to their seats before sitting down with his family. This is too much. You don't have to go to such lengths to prepare foods. This good for us, Henry exclaimed when he saw that the dining table was lined with foods that were both attractive in aroma and looks. You're our guest. It's normal that we prepare something special. I hope these suit your taste, Connor smiled. Don't worry about it, Harris said. My father is not picky about his food. Something normal would do. Henry nodded in agreement, as his life for the past few years had been gloomy, and so was his desire for tasty foods. Ever since he had been separated from Christine, he could not find new excitement in life. He could even sleep in the worst bed and eat the worst food. Nothing mattered much to him. And that was why he wanted to visit the manor, because there was a person there he was longing to meet. Henry looked at the empty seat just across him and asked, Are we waiting for someone? Yes, Megan said. My mother is changing upstairs. Please have some food now. I'll go check up on her. Megan left the table and went looking for her mother. Christine had already washed and changed into simple clothing. When Megan came looking for her, she said, I think it's best if I don't join you. 
Christine was worried that she might interrupt them since the guests were important people and they might need to discuss something over their meal. While staying here, Christine was deeply concerned about being a burden to her daughter and son-in-law. No way. Mother, you've been busy preparing for the whole morning. You have to join us. Come on, everyone else is waiting. Megan gave her mother no excuse and dragged her downstairs. Following her daughter, Christine walked towards the dining room. The closer they got to the room, the more suspicious she felt upon hearing the voices. Who are their guests today? Opening the door, Megan took her mother into the dining room while people turned to look at them. When Christine saw Henry, she felt shocked and perplexed. She wanted to leave right away. No, I, I better go. Mother, we are already here. Take a seat. Megan thought her mother was merely being shy, so she pulled her into a seat. Christine sat across from Megan and next to Harris. To the right of Harris, there was Henry. This is very inappropriate. Being too close to him made her extremely nervous and she was almost choking. Ever since she was seated, she felt like she was sitting on thorns. She had no idea about how the others felt. As for herself, she just wanted to run away from him. Mother, don't be nervous. Let me introduce our guest. This is President Henry. He gave us great support when Connor and General Harris saved you. Megan officially introduced him while Christine kept looking down and nodding in acknowledgement. Sitting next to you is General Harris. I'm sure you remember him, Megan continued. Christine kept nodding without raising her head. Finishing the introduction, Megan turned to the two honored guests. Mr. President and General Harris, let's get started. Help yourself, please. My mother cooked for you herself just to express our great appreciation. Hearing that Christine had cooked for them, Henry was surprised and could not help stealing a glance at her. It had been so long since she had last cooked for him. He had almost forgotten the taste. He picked up the knife and fork and took one bite of the most delicately plated dish on the table. There came the familiar taste as well as the sweet memories. It was indeed her cooking. He could tell at once. Ever since he had tried her cooking many years ago, he had lost his appetite for whatever others made. He thought that he had lost his sense of taste. But now he realized that it was not him losing his taste, but rather his stomach longing for her cooking. This is great, just as I remembered. Henry said it genuinely, but Harris sensed the implication and asked curiously, Father, what do you remember? Do you mean you have tried Auntie Christine's dishes before? Christine heard it too and took a glance at him in surprise. Henry realized that he was being inappropriate. He coughed awkwardly and tried to explain, um, No, no, I meant it tastes like my mother's cooking. It was a good explanation. Christine felt relieved while the rest found it reasonable. Henry had a lot. It was very surprising to Harris. Father, you've got quite some appetite today. In fact, ever since he found his father's secret in the study last time, he knew for sure that his father must have known Christine from long ago. Harris knew that Christine was the violin diva that had been known to the whole world in the past, and that she had even held a concert in California in the past. That was how his father became her fan. Harris guessed that his father fell in love with Christine in the past, which led to the awkwardness that he was sensing. Yet, he did not expose his father. Henry shot an in-depth glance at his son and knew what he meant. It's because the food is good, Henry explained. You youngsters should not waste food. I get it, I get it, I'll finish it, Harris laughed, but these are seriously good. Everyone began to dig in, but Christine could feel some sneaking glances at her from time to time and, and made her uncomfortable. That was one thing that really surprised her, being able to eat at the same table as Gregory again. It was something she could have never imagined happening after they were separated. She sat beside his son and thought that Gregory had no idea that he was sitting just across from his own daughter. She could feel her heart tightening as she tried to hold her tears back. 
Megan, I'm feeling a little unwell, Christine said, trying to leave in case she really started crying. I'm going to go back to my room now. Mom, are you all right? Megan did notice that her mother's skin was paler than it used to be, so pale that she looked like a ghost. I'm fine. Christine shook her head and tried to get up, but as soon as she got up, she could feel her head spinning, and she grabbed the side of the table to steady herself. Mom, let me accompany you back to your room, Megan offered, afraid that her mother might collapse. I'm fine. Please, enjoy. Christine smiled and walked towards the door, but just steps before Christine could exit the dining room, everything went dark for her and she fainted. Mom, Megan screamed and rushed to her, but before Megan could reach her mother, a strong arm cushioned Christine's fall. Henry got to Christine in time. When she fell into his arms, he could finally feel how skinny she had really become. He could even lift her without using any strength. Mom, are you all right? Megan shouted, but she got no response from Christine. Harris, hurry up and contact Rowan, Henry ordered. On it. Mr. President, allow me. Connor offered his help. It's okay, she's not even heavy, Henry refused. Henry was worried about the woman he loved, the woman who was lying in his arms and giving no response. Where should I put her? Henry asked. Her room, Megan said and guided them to Christine's room upstairs. Henry helped her take off her shoes, placed her on the bed, rearranged the pillow, and tucked her in. He did this carefully and then automatically got a hold of her hand. It felt like he was taking care of some family members at his own home. Megan was stunned while he did so, especially when he got a hold of her mother's hand. It felt too... Mr. President? Megan could not help interrupting. Upon hearing their calling... Henry turned to see her staring at his hand holding Christine's. He suddenly came back to his senses, released her hand, and tried to explain. I've helped you get her here. Now I should leave. Please take good care of your mother. Despite his reluctance, Henry took another glance at Christine and left the room. Sure, thank you, Mr. President. Megan nodded with appreciation. When Henry was about to step out of the room, Megan called to stop him all of a sudden. Mr. President? Yes. Henry stopped and turned around. You know my mother, don't you? I do, but she... Henry tried to find a proper excuse. He was worried that he might have been overreacting just now. He wondered if his daughter was suspecting anything. Before he could provide an answer, Megan smiled and said, I know, you must be her fan too. I saw a picture in the moon castle of my mother playing the violin. Indeed, I am a big fan of hers. That is indeed flattering. I will definitely let her know. Anyway, thank you again, Mr. President. Megan bowed to him. Don't mention it. Henry got downstairs, but instead of leaving the villa, he waited until Rowan arrived. He had to know Christine's condition before he could leave. Rowan hurried into the villa. Upon seeing Henry in the parlor, he thought he was hallucinating. Oh dear, Uncle, how come you are here? Rowan had never seen Mr. President in anyone else's home, nor had he seen him being with any personal friend. He had always been the figure in the news, paying state visits and participating in various summits and delegations. Henry nodded without saying a word. Harris told him, This is a secret. I called you here to attend to the patient. Don't be nosy. Rowan understood that the president's whereabouts always had to be kept secret. Without taking any further questions, Rowan was escorted upstairs to check on Christine. When he was finished and came downstairs, Harris asked, Are you done? How is Auntie Christine? Harris actually asked on behalf of his father. He knew that his father was worried about Christine. She is very weak and has hypoglycemia. That was why she fainted. Then what should they do? Nothing but take good care of her. Will she recover? Probably. I looked at Megan's herbal cuisine and treatment plan. As long as they continue with that, I'm sure she'll be fine. I see. Harris nodded. He took a glance at his father and wondered if he felt relieved now.
stared into the ceiling as if he was thinking about something, but in truth, he was worried about Christine. He felt relief when he learned that she was okay and only needed time to recover from her weak body. Henry really wished that he could bring Christine back to his place so that he could take care of her. Mr. President Harris, I'll take my leave now. Are you guys staying? Rowan asked as he had something else to do. No, let's sleep together, Harris said. They waited for Connor and Megan to come down and said their goodbyes before leaving the manor. At first, the family planned to wait for Christine to get better and bring her back to New York to meet Richard. But since Christine was still weak, they had to push their plan to a later date. A few days after Henry visited, Megan helped her mother to the living room where an old man was waiting. The closer Christine got to the old man, the harder it felt for her. She fell beneath the old man's feet and cried, Dad? You, you, it's really you, Richard sobbed as he helped his daughter up. Ever since Megan moved to California, she had been looking for a way to get her grandfather to live with her. But the old man was stubborn and did not want to leave the place he grew up in. But Megan finally succeeded when the old man learned that his daughter was still alive, and it pained him to see the state that his daughter was in. Oh, my daughter. What have I done? I should not have blamed you. Richard cried as he recalled how he had pushed his daughter away in the past. Richard only learned about the truth after he saw Landscape, about how his daughter was being coerced into a miserable life. He blamed himself for not being able to notice it as her father and not offering her any form of protection. It's all right. Let's just leave what's in the past as it is. Christine comforted him. I'm alive, aren't I? You're right. As long as you're alive. Richard did some thinking and wondered why he was still staying in New York when his family was all in California. You win, Richard said to Megan. I've decided to move here too. Our family will no longer be apart. Megan was glad to hear her grandfather changing his mind. She had already discussed it with her uncle. They decided to let Richard stay in Xavier's rarely used mansion if he ever decided to move to California, but for the time being, Richard would be staying in JS's base with Xavier until everything at the mansion was sorted out, while Christine would continue to remain in the manor so that Megan could help her get her health back. Connor and Megan also planned to open another clinic in California for Richard, shifting the Medicine Hall's base of operation to California. They agreed that it was the best way to keep the old man's mind occupied so that he wouldn't miss New York too much. Their plans were carried out in order. Connor received his own treatments as well as taking care of the Lee family. After a course of treatment and medication, his mania was under control and seldom bothered him. They believed that he would recover soon. Outside the hospital, Harris was waiting for him in the jeep. Seeing Connor stepping out of the hospital, he called, Bro, over here. How come you came yourself? Are you giving me a lift? Connor only asked for his tally, but Harris happened not to be occupied. Therefore, he came himself to make up for his drunken episode. I didn't make it to the border last time because of my silly drunkenness. Let me make it up today. Let's go. All right. Connor did not reject it. Harris was living like a tally. It would only make it easier for them to cross the border. On their way, Harris could not help asking, Bro, what did you do across the border last time? We went for my master. Connor told the truth. Harris found it unbelievable. Do you mean your master lives across the border? There's nothing but ice fields beyond that point. How could he live there by himself? Do you know what's across the border of California? Connor asked. Of course, it used to be the Dragon Kingdom, but the country was ruined many years ago and has been covered in ice and snow ever since. I heard the iceberg over the Dragon Kingdom has been melting lately. Yeah, I heard that too. 
How strange, Harris felt excited, then wondered upon second thought. But what does that have to do with your master? You'll figure it out soon. Connor spared a mysterious look instead of providing an explanation and left him with doubts. Arriving at the border, Harris showed his tally. The soldiers saluted to their highest commander and let them pass. Entering the Dragon Kingdom, they found that Wyatt was already waiting for them with a group of people. Connor. Seeing that Connor had come with another person, he wondered, Who is this? Uncle Wyatt, let me introduce General Harris, the chief commander of California. Then he turned to Harris and said, This is my master, Uncle Wyatt. Hello, Uncle Wyatt. Harris reached out to shake hands with him. Pleased to meet you. I've heard so much about General Harris. I'm also an acquaintance of your father, Henry. Wyatt used to assist the former King Colin, who had befriended Henry. The two countries also had friendly relations and kept frequent commercial interactions as well as summit meetings. So Uncle Wyatt is a friend of my father. Nice meeting you. Harris was surprised to know that Connor's master was acquainted with his father. After getting to know Harris, Wyatt introduced his group to Connor. Connor, this is Julian, the former Minister of Communications. This is Levi, a former ambassador, and they are... Wyatt had gathered all the important former officials of the Dragon Kingdom. He wanted them to meet their prince as well as plan for the rejuvenation of the Dragon Kingdom. These people were already aware that Connor was the son of their former king who had been secretly sent out of the country at the time of strife. Connor was a grown man when they were finally able to meet him, but they did not expect that he was also the head of JS, the person who brought all 24 countries together to fight against the Dark Zone. They believed that if Connor were to succeed the throne, it wouldn't be long before the Dragon Kingdom would rise again. Everyone kneels before Connor and greeted, My lord, please get up, Connor said as he hurried to help them up. Harris couldn't believe what he was seeing. Even if he had high expectations for Connor, he could have never even dared to imagine that he was actually the heir to a throne, the Emperor of the Dragon Kingdom. Wyatt brought Connor to check on the ruins inside the kingdom on a helicopter. Ever since the system came back online, the ice has begun to melt, Wyatt explained as he pointed at a tower. Look, we can even see some of the buildings now. That's the capital's clock tower, and that's the palace. Everyone turned to look where Wyatt was pointing and saw that the top of the palace was visible to them. After flying over the capital, Connor asked the pilot to take them to the border. The nearby glacier had melted into rivers, flowing into California's territory. Uncle Wyatt, we have to inspect how the water flows to prevent flash floods, Connor said. I will. And we have to prepare for any virus outbreaks. Connor predicted that the remains of those being slaughtered in the war were still under the ice. When the ice melted and their bodies came in contact with the air, it could cause a huge virus outbreak. Will do. Wyatt and the other people were glad to see the way Connor acted. He showed the compassion and the responsibility that a leader should have. I'll talk to my father too, Harris said. I'll try to get some of our people over to help with the rebuilding. Thank you. Connor thanked him from the bottom of that a leader should have. I'll talk to my father too, Harris said. I'll try to get some of our people over to help with the rebuilding. Thank you. Connor thanked him from the bottom of his heart. Don't thank me. You are my brother. Helping you is what I should at least do, Harris laughed. 
Harris knew that maintaining a good relationship was the right choice. If Connor were to succeed in resurrecting this kingdom, they could continue the past friendly relationship between the two countries. They could become best friends, just like his father and Colin were in the past. Connor was also thankful for the support and compassion that Harris and his father showed him. If not for them, he would never have had the stable life with Megan that he was enjoying. They decided to head back to the city after the inspection. I'm not sure if I can succeed or not, Connor said to Harris on their way back. If possible, I would like you to keep this a secret for now. Don't worry, I'll only tell my father about it. He will be delighted to learn that the son of his best friend is still alive. They began to talk about the details when a bullet shot through the car they were in. Suddenly, a bullet came out of nowhere. It broke the window and brushed past Harris's nose. Shit, an ambush. Harris pressed down on the accelerator and tried to speed up, but intensive bullets came from behind and hit the car. In order to dodge the bullets, Harris kept zigzagging and eventually got out of the attack. The car sped towards the mountain road. Before they reached the mountain, they already saw the ambush with sentries on both sides. Bullets were shot at the car, hitting the windshield and barely missing them. Bro, in the black case under your seat, there are weapons we can use. Harris was driving and couldn't reach for the weapons, but he turned to realize that the man next to him had already gotten a hold of the weapons and assembled them. Connor had a sharp sense for assembling weapons and sniping. He reached out the window and fired. of the attack. The car sped towards the mountain road. Before they reached the mountain, they are already saw the ambush with sentries on both sides. Bullets were shot at the car, hitting the windshield and barely missing them. Bro, in the black case under your seat, there are weapons we can use. Harris was driving and couldn't reach for the weapons, but he turned to realize that the man next to him had already gotten a hold of the weapons and assembled them. Connor had a sharp sense for assembling weapons and sniping. He reached out the window and fired back. In a few shots, the enemies were hit and fell down from the mountain. Brilliant. He'd barely finished his words just now. He was so fast. Harris was filled with admiration and yelled, How did you know I had guns in the car? I saw them last time. They survived the first two rounds, but did not realize that there was a third one. Their rivals were definitely after Harris and wanted him dead. There were rocks scattered on the road. They could not drive through and had to turn back. Upon turning back, they found that the road had already been blocked off by a few cars. They stood aggressively on the cars and pointed the guns right at them. There's going to be a hard fight today. Harris's handsome eyes got stern as he took the guns and bullets from Connor. They exchanged a look and got out to hide behind the car. Connor started shooting and their rivals fell down from the cars one after another. Bang, bang, bang. The fight began. Their enemies had sufficient fire supply and kept shooting at them. Connor and Harris could not afford to continuously suppress due to the limited ammo. They had to make each of their bullets count. They made one shot after another and their enemies were taken down one after another. Connor and Harris worked together perfectly. They hid behind the rear of the car. Harris turned to Connor and mocked. We are Damon and Pythias now. Last time they were attacked in the small town in the south, they lay wounded in the bar. Today, they fought together again. My wife saved your life. Take it seriously. Upon saying so, Connor turned to shoot again and so did Harris. After half an hour, they had managed to take down all the enemies. Connor stepped out and kicked the dead bodies. 
Who are they? Harris checked around and could only tell that they were from California. No idea. They probably came for me. Why are you so sure? Connor asked. Harris frowned and said, I'm not sure, but I know there's a secret force from California that has been trying to assassinate me. They have made several attempts in vain. Unfortunately, I was not able to find out who they were and who they worked for until now. Could they be from the dark zone, like those in the small town last time? Connor conjectured. I don't think so, Henry analyzed. Every attack from the dark zone was very well coordinated, but this one is just plain bad. But Harris could not find anything that could tell him who had sent the attackers. He called some of his men to come and clean the scene up when he turned and saw that Connor was hurt. Shit, you got shot? Connor had gotten shot in his lower left abdomen, but Harris could not notice it at first because he was wearing a dark colored shirt. I'm fine, Connor said without one thing. Well, I'm not. If anything happens to you in California, Megan will definitely kill me. Harris scolded as he got his keys. Come on, I'll get you to a doctor. Harris drove as fast as he could to the military hospital. He kicked Rowan's door open and shouted, Rowan, we need help. Rowan raised his head and saw Harris carrying a pale Connor. What happened? There's no time to explain. Take care of his wound first. Take off his jacket. Harris quickly helped Connor take off his jacket and showed his white shirt inside that was dyed in red. That too, Rowan said, pointing at the white shirt. After Connor took his shirt off, his muscular body was a naked view. Rowan stared at Connor's perfect body and his mind went blank. Harris noticed that Rowan was not moving and raised his head to check only to see Rowan was staring attractively at Connor. Hurry up, you moron, Harris scolded as he kicked Rowan. Rowan's face reddened and he performed a quick check on Connor's wound. After a few minutes, Rowan took a bullet out from Connor's body and put it on a small tray. Then he continued to disinfect the wound and stitch it up. Don't let the wound come in contact with water for a week, Rowan said. Oh, and no sex either. Rowan took off his gloves but couldn't help but stare at Connor's body again. What a great body, Rowan blurted out. Both Connor and Harris looked at Rowan with disgusted faces. Hey, stop staring, Harris scolded. He already has a wife and a kid. If you want a boyfriend, I can introduce someone to you. No need for that, Rowan smiled. I'm satisfied with the two of you. Go to hell, both of the men said and kicked Rowan. Harris drove Connor back to his home after they left the hospital. Megan was waiting for Connor in the living room. Why are you so late? Megan asked, noticing that it was already quite late. Dr. Goo was kind of busy today, so I had to wait for a little longer. Connor lied, not daring to tell Megan that he had been shot. I see. Wait, what's that smell? Megan could smell a different scent coming from Connor, and it seems like medicine. I think it's the hospital, Connor explained. There wasn't anything wrong with the answer, but Megan could tell that something was up. As they always said, a man could easily cheat on his pregnant wife. Normally, Megan would never distrust her husband, but now she is pregnant. She was entitled to be a bit oversensitive. She remembered that he was in a different suit when he left home earlier on, so she asked, When did you get changed? Connor felt a bit nervous and tried to cover it. It got stained, so I bought another one. To stop her from further questioning, Connor tried to change the topic. Come on, honey, let's go inside. Megan did not ask further. She tried to hold him around the waist, but her man snuck away and moved to her right side. Something is wrong. Definitely wrong. Megan was sensitive enough to tell it, but she tried to convince herself that it was her being oversensitive. Connor loved her wholeheartedly. Even if every other man on earth would cheat, he would definitely not. It made her feel better to think this way. In the evening, Megan took a bath and got into new nightwear. It was very thin and sexy. She bought it for him. She came out of the bathroom, entered the bedroom, and found that Connor was focusing on his book as if he didn't see her. Honey... Megan called him sweetly, slightly lifted the dress, and asked when he raised his head. 
You like it? Seeing his wife in such hot night wear, Connor felt his blood flowing reversely. It was way too alluring. She was literally seducing him, but he could not do it tonight because of the wound. What torture. Absolutely. Connor forced himself to calm down and planned to make it up when he recovered. He turned back to his book again and left Megan wondering, could the book look better than I do? Megan was not giving up. She got onto the bed, snuck into his arms, and cuddled him around his waist. She happened to hit his wound on the left side of his waist, and Connor groaned slightly in pain, but he tried hard to bear it. Hearing that his voice had changed, she felt certain that he was provoked. She tried further, honey, it's bedtime. Yes, honey, good night. Connor placed a kiss upon her forehead and kept reading his book. Megan was about to blow. How could he still remain calm while she played so hard? She was so not giving up. She pushed away his book, cuddled him on the neck, and insisted, Honey, it's our bedtime. Fine. Connor surrendered and they laid down together. Then nothing happened. Megan found it unbelievable. Was this still her dear husband? How could he be so apathetic? Under the quilt, she placed her leg on him and could distinctively sense his response, but why was he refraining from caressing her? Was it because she was pregnant, or was he not in the mood? Megan tried to think of every possibility, and almost felt like getting up and asking him straightforwardly. That's it for today, guys. If you want to inspire me more, you can buy me a puppy. Thank you for listening.